are we live? Hey everybody, Chef AJ here, and before we begin the Weight Loss Wednesday broadcast, I'd like to tell you about a wonderful new book written by my friend and colleague, Dr. Neil Barnard, the founder of PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. It's so funny because he was actually on Dr. Oz today discussing this book. If you have a problem giving up cheese or know somebody that does, this is the book for you. He explained scientifically why it's so difficult. I remember when I interviewed Howard Lyman, the mad cowboy, he said it was harder for him to quit cheese than it was smoking. So it's not in your head. It is addictive, it has to do with the opiates and a lot of the things we talk about on Weight Loss Wednesday when we talk about addiction. But if you haven't read it, it's sure to be a bestseller. It's a great book, The Cheese Traps. So. There we go. So we got some people watching, Kenny. We'll get ready 33. to get start. 33. It's a good number. So welcome to episode 22 of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. And this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. And boy, Kenny, we have a lot of questions today and they all came in this morning. I haven't had a chance to even review some of them. And so I had ended last week's broadcast in the middle of a question and that question honestly will take a whole episode so I'm going to wait for one time when Kenny has a meeting or something that I can sit down and do what I call the 10 E's that foster disease but that's something I really want to think about. But before I begin Kenny always wants me to remind you where I'm going to be so you can come see me in person if you're in the Los Angeles area or willing to travel in Pasadena I will be presenting both a scientific lecture, well not necessarily scientific, but it's the secrets to ultimate weight loss, and two cooking demos at the Engine 2 Forks Over Knives conference on March 25th and 26th. If you want $50 off your ticket, it's Chef AJ50. And the following week, I'll be at the Health Fest in Marshall, Texas. There's still some tickets left. There's gonna be a lot of wonderful presenters, including all three McDougals. Well, there's more than three, but the three that are coming are Dr. John McDougal, Dr. Craig McDougal, and Mary McDougal. And then April 8th, I will be at the Oak Spa at Ojai. Kitty's giving me the signal that uh, my <laughs> thing is coming up. We're, we're learning how to, how to communicate with each other. So that's where I'll be for the next uh, upcoming uh, three weeks. So, all right. So the, Kay has two questions and she says, the first one is that salt is her greatest trigger. We talk a lot about trigger foods in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. These are generally foods that perpetuate overeating, and it doesn't always have to be an addictive food like sugar, flour, or alcohol to be a trigger food for you. It could be a perfectly healthy food like nuts, but for some people these are trigger foods, tahini, things like that. So Kay says that salt is her greatest trigger, but that she cannot eliminate salt from her environment. We talk about how important environmental control is in solving this problem, this disease. She says she can't eliminate it from her environment as she cooks for her husband, and he would never agree to salt to be gone. Otherwise, he is very supportive. That's wonderful. So she wants to know if there's any essential oils to help at moments she has cravings for salt. So I love essential oils. I use doTERRA but I'm not a representative, I don't know a lot about it. I defer to my partner, John Pierre. And so I did ask him your question, and he said he doesn't know of any essential oils per se that are specifically for salt cravings. The ones you use for other cravings might work, but he did say this is where green powders could work. So my recommendation, Kay, for you, is since your husband is supportive, then ask him to just add salt at the table meaning don't cook with salt. You know, I talked about this in my book on process, that sugar, oil, salt, if you cook with them, they dissipate anyway. So if you're going to use these, put that on top of the food at the surface, as we call in chef dom, the finish where the taste buds on the tip of your tongue can take, taste it. Because any salt you cook with or oil or sugar, it's gonna dissipate anyway. So don't cook with salt and then ask him to add it at the table or better yet, don't have it in the house, you can buy little vials of salt for travel, all different kinds of salt, Celtic, Himalayan, and he can keep it in his pocket. There are these little vials and just ask him to please only use them on his food and put it back in his pocket so that hopefully you're not tempted by that. I hope it works out for you. We know that sugar, oil, and salt, which is what I call the evil trinity, for most people, even if they're full-fledged, card-carrying sugar addicts, salt seems to be the hardest because there's really no substitute per se. I mean, I love Menson's Table Tasty, but for people that are hardcore super tasters for salt, you know, that's it. Last week, episode 21, I showed you some different varieties of things that still have salt but have lower sodium. She also wants to know, what do you do if you're going to the store to buy vegetables and you pick up other crap and eat it before you get home? Heard that a lot. Things like french fries, eating them through the drive-thru before you get home. 
So, uh, don't go to the store. <laughs> and you know, you don't have to anymore, truthfully. Nowadays, you can get your groceries delivered by just about everywhere. Costco delivers, maybe even Whole Foods delivers. I don't think Trader Joe's does, but there are so many stores that deliver. Produce, especially, you can get a CSA box. You really don't have to leave home. You can buy almost everything online through places like Amazon or Vitacost, and even fresh produce, believe it or not. So that's one strategy. The other strategy is never go shopping when you're hungry and always go stop sh stopping, go shopping with adequate starch in your belly. Because if you're eating french fries, well that is starch, but unfortunately it's starch that's doused with fat and salt, you know, deep fried in oil with a lot of salt on it, probably sugar too. And what happens with french fries is you take a healthy food like a potato that's 400 calories a pound, that has water and fiber and vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidants and micronutrients, and you deep fry it in a non-food like substance, which is oil that's 4,000 calories a pound, now you've increased the caloric density to 2,500 calories a pound, more than six times what that potato would have been. And of course, you're adding all that salt and all those other chemicals. So the thing is, is we talk about this a lot in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program that we prefer these foods of a higher caloric density because they release more dopamine in the brain. So we've got to find ways to get that good feeling without turning to the food. And if you're eating for reasons outside of hunger, like stress or loneliness or anger or anxiety or depression or boredom, you know, these foods of a lower caloric density, like fruits and vegetables, they're just not gonna satisfy you if you're looking to medicate with food, so you gotta deal with what you're eating instead of just what's eating you. But one of the reasons that people, and, and I, again, I can't ascertain from this question whether you're eating a reasonable amount of crap or you're binging on it, one of the main reasons people binge is due to previous history of restriction and then not eating enough starch. We can't be afraid of starch. This is where the satiety comes from. You need the bulk of your calories from starch. And if you skimp on starch, you're going to be, you're not going to be satiated and you will be more prone to overeat in general, but on these unhealthy foods in particular. So thank you. Any questions before I move on, Kenny? All right, but people are there, right? We have people from Germany, Australia. Germany, wow. And you know, there's a vegan grocery store in Germany that my friend Linda Middlesworth told me about called Vegans, so pretty cool. Okay, Ohio. So, wow, Ohio. North Charlotte, Carolina. I just interviewed Kathy Hester today from North Carolina. Uh, speaking of interviews, I, I do a one video interview a week and we try to send it out once a week, the Dr. Goldhammer one. Fabulous went out today. If you didn't receive that in your inbox first thing this morning, it's because you're not on my mailing list. So you need to sign up at www.eatunprocessed.com. Click that little box, we send you a recipe, and then we'll send you that video every week. And it's all the, the best way for you to submit questions. So Bella wants my opinion on eating mature coconut meat, about eight ounces a day. Well, what are your goals? Because I looked it up in the, uh, what's it called, the USDA, uh, database for they have you know all the calories and all the different foods so eight ounces of coconut meat is 803 calories now I don't know how tall you are or how much you weigh how much you can eat but for me that would be like half my caloric intake for the day basically so it's 803 calories 76 grams of fat and 67 grams of saturated fat now I use this as a as a prop when I teach I'll be showing this in my demonstration at the engine 2 conference but if you were to eat this entire one half pound bag of a generic M&M, Trader Joe's m and you would have about two thirds less saturated fat than in that mere eight ounces of wow. coconut. Now here's the thing, I, I possibly you're familiar with Dr. John McDougall, one of my mentors who has been saying for 40 years, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. It's probably worse from coconut, maybe not necessarily worse than animals, but certainly worse than fat that comes from avocado, nuts or seeds because coconut is higher in saturated fat, that's the bad artery clogging kind, than even lard. It's higher in saturated fat than lard, and you're eating, you wanna eat seven, 67 grams of saturated fat a day? What kind of shape are your arteries in? Have you ever had an arterial scan? Because if you're eating this every day, that is a lot of fat and it's a lot of saturated fat. That's probably more saturated fat than I get in a month, and in one day you're eating more fat than I'm eating in two weeks. So. I would vote thumbs down, whether it's for weight loss, whether it's for health. 
you know, I think coconut is a treat that, you know, a little bit sprinkled maybe on a fruit salad or a recipe, but it, I don't think it's something you want to eat every day. What successful population has eaten this much coconut every day? I don't, I, I don't understand. And there's really not a lot of satiety in fat. I know people like it because of its high caloric density. It releases more dopamine in the brain. But as far as satiety, that's where starch comes in, especially potatoes. So I don't know if your goal is weight loss or health. Are there good fatty acids, though? But here's the thing. Are you guys not eating vegetables? You know, I, I just interviewed David Goldman, the dietitian at True North, and he says if you're eating enough vegetables, particularly greens like I am, meaning about four pounds of vegetables a day, you're getting enough of this ALA and the DHA. So sure, there's some good fatty acids, but I mean, how much is enough? You know, just because a little bit is good doesn't mean more is better. I mean, this is an egregious amount of fat, I think, to eat every day. And, and I don't know if you're a raw foodist, but that would be one of the reasons you would have to eat that much fat because if all you're eating is fruits and vegetables at a caloric density of 300 calories per pound or less, you're gonna be pretty hungry. And it's pretty hard to just live on a caloric density that low. Now there's people that do it like Robbie Barbaro, the mindful diabetic who I just interviewed. He's on a very specific kind of diet for his type one diabetes, but his is primarily fruit. The thing is, is it's very hard to meet your caloric needs on just fruits and vegetables. And for most people, it's hard to achieve satiety. So I don't recommend a high fat diet. And I certainly don't recommend coconut is the fat. If Kenny, if somebody wanted to eat fat, I'd recommend, you know, an ounce of walnuts a day or flax seeds or chia seeds, but, but, but not eight ounces of coconut. So, so yeah. we got a question. Sure. Someone's talking about, um, this one from Toronto here, but let's go back. Okay. <clears throat> he says, Tony, I'm confused about flour. You don't eat it, but... Dr. McDougall encourages it. Please advise. I don't think Dr. McDougall encourages it. I don't think, I think you're using the wrong word. He allows it. If you read his book, The McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss, that is a book that is completely in line with the Ultimate Weight Loss Program and the True North Dietary Style. There's absolutely no flour at all. So he doesn't encourage it. And if you read his book, he talks about how when you grind a whole grain into a, a flour, you not only increase its caloric density, so for example, if you were to eat 500 calories of brown rice, Tony, which would completely fill your stomach, which is about the size of a cantaloupe and holds about a liter of food, easily 500 calories of brown rice or any whole grain would fit in there and you'd activate your mechanisms of satiety like your stretch and nutrient receptors and your calorie receptors. You mill that brown rice into a flour to make a gluten-free bread or pasta and now you need 1,500 calories to fill the same space in the tank. But what Dr. McDougall specifically talks about in his McDougal program for maximum weight loss book is that when you take an intact whole grain and you cut it with a sharp blade, you now have a broken grain, which means when you ingest it, you've increased its surface area, which means you increase the absorption in your intestine. And when that happens, your blood sugar gets raised more quickly, which in turn raises your insulin more quickly. Insulin is the hormone responsible for driving fat into the cells. So I don't think Dr. McDougal encourages it, he allows it. But whole foods are always best. Potatoes, rice, beans, winter squashes, legumes. So I think you're mistaken that he's encouraging it, he's allowing it. And for food addicts, it's the kiss of death, sugar and flour. Then when, yeah. you, when you chew and you're chewing it, doesn't that make more surface space and break it down to a certain level? Not the same way. Your teeth are, are, are not the same as the sharp blade. You know, Dr. Esselstyn always says that we didn't exit our mother's wombs clutching a Vitamix. So it, our teeth, our 32 mechanical juicers and blenders, we have to chew much more than we would when a machine has processed it. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. I haven't sharpened my teeth lately. All right, so. Are steel cut oats okay? Yeah, steel cut oats are the second incarnation of oat. I still prefer the wholer form, which is the oat growth, but steel cut oats are fine. What and do I get? oats are even okay too. I wouldn't recommend instant, but I recommend the wholest version. Where do we get oat growths? Because I've never oh, seen them Whole store. Foods, almost every natural food store, they're sold in bulk. They're and how delicious. much longer does it take to cook? Well, if you have an instant pot, five minutes. So but you don't cook an instant pot for one. Uh, you can make two servings. I, I actually okay. uh, interviewed Kathy Hester today and, and together we cooked and I made a, a two serving uh, recipe of, of steel cut oats. So yeah, you sure could. Or you could get a small crock pot. You know, it's just they take a while to cook on the stove if you don't use the instant pot. Are whole grains and legumes nutritionally necessary in a whole food plant-based diet? If so, why, Lori? Well, here's the thing. You cannot live on grains and legumes because they lack vitamin A and C, but you could live on potatoes or sweet potatoes if you had to. And actually, several people have gone a, a year 
just living on potatoes, like Andrew Spudfit Taylor, who lost 120 pounds. Oh. Chris Voigt went several months living on potatoes and Google the KON potato study. So you can't live on grains and legumes. You would have to eat those with some fruits and vegetables to get the vitamin A and C, but you could live on potatoes. So, all right. So this is a question for Anonymous, and in, unless you tell me, I, I usually just say the person's first name when you send me a question, unless you say, don't say my name, and then in which case I say Anonymous, or I change the name, but I, this is uh, Anonymous. So Anonymous says that she has a delicate digestion, I believe I do as well, and has been constipated most of her life, I used to be as well, at least while I was a sugar addict, and that if she doesn't drink coffee with soy milk and sugar in the morning, she doesn't poop and she does not seem to be able to lose weight. So a uh, cause does not always equal effect, first of all, and I did some research on this and apparently something like 29% of the people that drink coffee in the morning say it helps them poop. And they're giving speculation as to reasons why, but a lot of it has to do with just the behavior, that in other words, you're GI tract expects a beverage, particularly a warm beverage in the morning, you drink it and you poop. There is some marginal research that there are some chemical compounds in there that stimulate the GI tract that do that. But that said, do you really want to be dependent on a drug, an addictive drug, uh, central nervous system uh, stimulant for the rest of your life to be able to poop? And if something in there is helping you poop, it's in the coffee, it's in the chemicals in the coffee, it is not the sugar in the soy milk, I can promise you that. And so if you're trying to lose weight, you need to get rid of both of those like right now. Now, I would suggest that if you're following the Ultimate Weight Loss Program and you're eating the amount of vegetable material and fiber we recommend, you're not gonna have any trouble pooping. And if you're following UWL as design and still having trouble pooping, then you need, well, you should see a doctor anyway because there's myriad reasons for constipation, specifically see a GI doctor that have nothing to do with weight loss. And so I would definitely recommend that, especially if you've been constipated your whole life and especially if you're eating enough fruits and vegetables. You know, you could have IBS. There's all kinds of reasons for constipation. So the, the product I found that helped me, and you can see my interview on YouTube with Heather, is Heather's Tummy Fiber. It is, a, it is completely natural, it's very low cost, you can get it on Amazon. It is made from one ingredient only called acacia. There's no grittiness, there's no uh, gluckiness like Metamucil, so it, you can't taste it, it dissolves in solids, liquids, and it's fabulous. So. You know, I, I appreciate what Dr. McDougall said yesterday at his webinar, that decaf coffee is just as bad. Coffee's a drug, it's not a food, and I think there are other ways to poop without, uh, without coffee, sugar, or milk, because all those on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we got no trouble in that department. We got two questions. Mm -hmm. One is a lupus person, a recent person who just got lupus, and she wanted to know how she can incorporate eating flaxseed and chia seeds. I don't know why that means to come together. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. But that was one question. And everyone's been telling her, put it, put it in their oatmeal yeah. so, and other things like that. So Sorry for leaving. So, so the way that, um, okay, so flax seeds very easily just sprinkle it on your salad. But you have to ground them first. Yeah, well absolutely. Kenny's right because in order to be assimilated Flax seeds need to be ground and they need to be kept in the refrigerator, especially once they're ground. And you can either grind a lot of them at a time. If you have a Vitamix, or you can just get like a cheap coffee grinder at Bed Bath & Beyond and grind them. Or you can buy them pre-ground, but I'm told that they're, they stay fresher if you grind them yourself. So most people that eat flax seeds will just put them in their morning hot cereal like oatmeal or they'll sprinkle them on their salad. One ounce. Right, and you can use them, one tablespoon is enough. I don't know if a tablespoon is an ounce, but one tablespoon is usually plenty for most people. And I don't know if this is in his current cookbook, Bravo, but he makes a delicious flaxseed dressing at True North. Chia seeds are like really fun because you can take the tablespoons of chia seeds and put it in water and make like an agua fresca. It makes kind of this thick gel. You can mix it with fruit to make jam without using anything like pectin or any other thickeners. They're great for thickening salad dressings. You can also stir them into your morning oatmeal. But what's really cool about chia seeds is they gel and so they make things like pudding-like. So you can make, you can take like almond milk, non unsweetened almond milk with, with chia seeds and basically have pudding. You stir a banana in and it's delicious. Chia mama. Yeah, so yeah, they sell that at Costco, so that's pretty cool. So the other question mm -hmm. was, and again, I think this is, I'm not sure how this goes, but Julie Johansson, it sounds like mm -hmm. an actress, mm -hmm. 
How long on average does it take to neuroadapt to a sugar-free diet? Now, we're not never, saying sugar-free. Never, you never neuroadapt. In other words, you never get used to, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. No one should, shouldn't say you never neuroadapt. We answered this on a previous episode. It's not like salt or processed sugar. Right. Well, it's not like salt where 30 days and you, you've got that dialed down or fat, which takes 90 to 120 days. The thing is, is you always will have an inherent preference for sweet. We're born with taste buds on the tip of our tongue for sweet and salt. The first taste we get as infants, our breast milk, hopefully from our mother, which is very sweet. When we're in the womb, often amniotic fluid is leaking. That is sweet. So we come into this world already with a preference for sweet. So we never don't have that preference. But as far as processed sugar, it just depends how long have you been using that drug? What was your dose? And what are you eating now? That is why the Ultimate Weight Loss Program is so powerful for reversing food addiction in general and sugar addiction in specifically. And one of the ways we do this is with eating vegetables and eating vegetables for breakfast and we always find that when the people come into the program the more they fight this and the more they don't like it usually the, the greater their sugar addiction was so how long it takes I can't tell you because this is really truly where everybody's different sometimes people relapse and they got to kind of start over and, and go through detoxification withdrawal the truth is is it, it really depends on how much sugar you're eating now and and when what else you're eating you can learn to satisfy your sweet tooth with the fruit the whole fruit and nothing but the whole fruit so help you but can we say what we talked about last week as well is about the cake oatmeal versus the well so if you eat oatmeal with a lot of yeah yeah. then with fruit and all that that cake that sweetness will make you want to eat more sweetness all day long I, i agree with that and so 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 what kenny's talking about is i should probably call this the oatmeal paradox because a lot of people will come to the ultimate weight loss program and refuse to follow it the way we recommend and that's fine but then when they don't get the results we try to explain that there's nothing unhealthy about oatmeal you know rolled oats and there's nothing unhealthy about fruit but what we find is because people are so addicted to sugar and flour which are drugs not food they go through the same refining process as drugs and alcohol that they sort of get well maybe they shouldn't be eating them for weight loss and because of the fact that they're fiberless and nutrient deficient and that they have a very high caloric density so their go-to is oatmeal and fruit and they're not eating oat groats like I recommend or even steel cut oats always the most processed version the rolled or the instant oats and they're eating with a ton of fruit often dates or other dried fruit and so basically what they're doing is they're taking their addiction for sugar and flour and they're making a morning uh, breakfast that sure is more healthy than a Cinnabon, but what happens is the <laughs> oat, the rolled oat, is like cake, is like the bread or the flour, and the and the sugar is like the fruit, and so it's like it's just a way to have dessert in, for breakfast. But it's just it, that that sweetness yeah. will dry you right. all Absolutely. day long with the more sugar. The sooner you act, especially if you're a sugar addict, and even if you're not, because my husband is not, but he still eats vegetables for breakfast. We recommend that we, you do. What the rest of the world does is starting your day in a savory way. So if you're eating oats, you eat steel cut oats with shiitake mushrooms and nutritional yeast and some garlic and some greens. The sooner you activate that sweet taste in the morning, even with healthy fruit, the more you're going to crave sugar the rest of the day. So I'm not against fruit. I love fruit, but I save it for my treat, one to two pieces a day, not on an empty stomach and after I eat. All right. So, okay. So Kim says that she heard that the temperature in a pressure cooker goes so high that it kills all the nutrients in the food. Because of this, they, in quotes, I always wanna know who they is, recommend keeping cooking temperatures low, below about 120 degrees, and cook for longer times if necessary to preserve the food value. And it's raw. Well, see, they, it sounds like you're saying raw foodists because who else would say below 120? Do you know if this is correct, and if so, does the Instant Pot kill the nutrients? I'm hesitant about getting an Instant Pot for this reason, but would love the convenience. Well, I took your question to Dr. Michael Greger, and I actually printed out the research from the scientific journal, which I'm going to share with you. But first of all, you know, Dr. Michael Clapper of True North, he did a video about things called Digestion Made Easy, and I think this is where I heard him talk about it. But he says that what the raw food is claim has never been uh, uh, substantiated in the medical research. In other words, that, that if we eat food, we're killing the enzymes, the metabolic or the digestive enzymes, because the truth is, is we have hydrochloric acid in our stomach that's so powerful that it will kill everything anyway. And while it's true that cooking does destroy some of the nutrients in the food, by any method, by the way, steaming seems to be one of the most preferable, you, you destroy about 20 to 30% of the vitamins and minerals by cooking. But where do they go? If you're eating a soup, which you're probably making instant pot things like soups and stews, 
it goes right in the soup, you're eating it anyway. Now, when I cook vegetables, for example, in the Instant Pot, I drink the broth, it's delicious, it's a warm beverage, I call it pot liquor. So the thing is, is pre uh, boiling point is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're right, that in the pressure cooking is higher, 249 degrees Fahrenheit. But the thing is, is because it's such a shorter cooking time, you're actually preserving nutrients. And if you don't believe me, you can go to the medical research. I got this from Dr. Michael Greger. The name of the journal article is a comparison of the vitamin C content of vegetable stew when prepared on large scale and open pressure cookers. And they found that pressure cooking was the most favorable for preserving nutrients, especially vitamin C. So if you don't have an Instant Pot, I really recommend you get one. It will save you time, it will save you money, makes healthy meals in minutes. And if you use my name, AJ, not Chef AJ, just AJ, at the company website, www.instantpot.com, won't work on Amazon, you can get $50 off. And if you don't already have the Instant Pot, I do recommend the eight quart because you can cook four jumbo artichokes at the same time. Bam. So thank you. And Kenny just got an Instant Pot, so he's like really doing well with that. I made lentil soup oh, this week. Okay. I think I'm missing some of the questions. I might have forgotten some of them, but we'll get them next week. Okay. So this is from Diana, and she says that she's been vegetarian for several years and lost weight, kept it off, but still overweight, can't seem to lose any more, eating nuts, but stopped, only use them to make milk. She's been watching me for a while, and she says, my ultimate weight loss program sounds interesting. Thinking about joining, hope you will but concerned if it's the right plan for me. I've tried eating potatoes, but I notice that when I eat them, I don't feel right, I feel tired, and sometimes I have to lie down. I, I feel tired sometimes and have to lie down too, even when I don't eat potatoes, because I'm almost 60 and I work real hard. Sometimes I think it is my blood sugar spiking, but I'm not diabetic, although I'm considered borderline. This is one of the reasons why I wanna try the plan. Is this a common thing for those starting out? Um, would this plan work for me even if I'm pre-diabetic? What do you suggest? So Dr. Goldhammer, one of my mentors, says that there's no such thing as pre-diabetic. It's like being like pre-pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're that pre-diabetes, you're basically diabetic. So yes, it absolutely works beautifully for diabetes because it's the same diet that is recommended by all the other plant-based doctors. The only thing that's slightly different is maybe when we eat stuff and that we're uh, you know, maybe cutting out the the nuts for a little while till we can see if it's something that you can do. But absolutely, we have people in Ultimate Weight Loss that have completely reversed their diabetes and gotten off all their medications. So we know it works beautifully for that because it's the same guy that Dr. Esselstyn teaches his patient and Dr. Barnard and Dr. McDougall and the health promoting diet they've taught at True North for 32 years to 30,000 patients. So yes, it, this, I don't know what other plan, and, and it doesn't have, what I'm trying to say is I'm not saying it has to be Ultimate Weight Loss to reverse diabetes, but a whole food, plant-based diet that is low fat and no oil. This is how you reverse diabetes. And Dr. Barnard has a PBS special about this. He has a book called, I believe it's called Reversing Diabetes. So absolutely, you know, and as far as feeling tired, you know, tired, bloating, headache, there's, these are things that there, there's constipation. There's so many reasons, and I'm not a doctor. I just know that the, there's so many reasons a person can be tired, but you can keep a food journal. And then if you notice that every time you eat potatoes, you get tired, well, don't eat potatoes, eat sweet potatoes, eat, eat wild rice, you know, eat some kind of a starch. You don't have to eat white potatoes if you don't want to. I know that people that go to their doctor, who's not just usually not a plant-based doctor will say that potatoes are too high in the glycemic index, don't eat them, so eat sweet potatoes. You eat winter squash, you know, that's some of the healthiest food on the planet, butternut squash and uh, kabocha squash. So absolutely, I hope you'll consider uh, trying the program and then we can help you in more detail and all the other people in the group that have reversed their diabetes can embrace you and help you. That's the thing about the program, guys. It's like somebody posted on Facebook a couple weeks ago, well, why should I join this program if I can do it myself for free? Well, then do it yourself. You know, the diet style we teach in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, there's like no secret. Well, you can do it yourself, then why haven't you done it and then you move on? If you right, exactly. need some help, you, you know, that's why you're exactly. there. Exactly. So, so please, we don't keep the diet a secret. I tell you from day one, it's the same diet that Dr. McDougall has in his Maximum Weight Loss Program book and that True North has taught. So the diet's not the secret. What you are getting when you join, other than recipes and 
and the ability to contact me and my partner John Pierre 24 hours a day is you're getting group support so you're with a tribe of people that have been doing this people that have lost 100 and 200 pounds and kept it off for four to five years now that have become your mentors so that's what you're getting as a community because it's pretty lonely out there when you eat differently even when you're just a vegan a regular vegan but when you're eating in a more specific manner to reverse a disease or suffering from food addiction you're with a group of people that get you and uh, AC told me uh, one of my uh, members of mastery the other day said that she heard this in a Dean Ornish lecture she said if you take the letters L L N E S L L N E S and you put I in front of it you get illness but if you put we in front of it you get wellness and there's just something magical about working with a group and research shows that people in groups do better not to say that people can't have success by themselves but if you could do it yourself wouldn't you have done it already let us help you you know 30 day money back guarantee I think you'll bam. like it bam I talk about this study group bam. thing with students all the time yeah it's true it's the same thing it's, it's true working together makes it better apps I like that working together makes it better That's good. so put a heart if you like that idea yeah and share these guys this is the 22nd episode I this put was a thumbs up this is funny because this is something I was gonna do just to the ultimate weight loss group and then I couldn't figure out how to work the phone and it ended up going out to everybody and that's kind of how it happened but please feel free to share it you know I put these on YouTube within 24 hours so please subscribe to my YouTube page and share that as well so uh, and if people are new to this give them episode 18 that's a really good place to start because it's like a frequently asked question all there right so Lois says she's been watching for a while and believe that the way I eat is the healthiest thank you I've been eating a whole food plant-based diet faithfully for four months good for you not been eating vegetables like you state but have cut out all animal products and oil very good I do not eat refined sugar or artificial sugars excellent but do eat maple syrup okay so maple syrup is a refined sugar because it's not really found in nature now you find maple trees in nature and you can possibly find the sap in nature in the tree if you're able to tap it but you have to understand that it takes about 40 gallons of that sap that is boiled down and reduced into one gallon of syrup so maple syrup may be less refined but it's still sugar sugar is sugar flour is flour salt is salt oil is oil but Not once in a while isn't it okay it depends if you're a food addict it's never okay moderation never works so well, you know you it, okay when you say okay Kenny okay for what not for food addiction, not for obesity. Might be okay, you know. Once a month? Your body's never not looking. For somebody like you, Kenny, that's naturally slender, that's not a food addict, you could probably have it every day. People like you and Charles and Dr. Doug Lyle, but those of us that suffer from the brain disease of refined food addiction, that one bite is never enough. You know, what, what's that saying, Kay Shepard? Uh, one bite is too many, a thousand is never enough, because that one bite can set us off into a binge that could last for days, weeks, months I've seen it happen so uh, maple syrup is sugar don't mean to burst your bubble it's you know it's it's all the same doesn't matter what you call it a rose by any other name still has thorns that will stick you and so it you know maybe just because something is less bad Lois doesn't mean it's good so that's that do eat salt I see a sad face go across I'm the screen sorry, now guys, sorry guys I know she says she does eat salt her downfall had stomach surgery sleeve gastrostomy me about six years ago and wish I'd seen you before me too you know I gotta say I know that that's different than the gastric bypass because my understanding is your stomach hasn't been mutilated and cut it's it's just being like clamped or something I, I could be wrong but we watched that show my 600 pound life and it's just so sad because they're told to eat a thousand calories a day of just protein and it would be I would just love to have a show where he does you know because actually there was one with identical twins recently I would love to have one of them move in with me and let him do gastric bypass on the other and see which one gets better that would be like my dream so if there's any casting directors out there so she says anyway she did lose a lot of weight but have put it on a, a little on since she retired wondering if the ultimate weight loss program would work for me tried a few things the, the, the raw didn't work yeah we talked about that why raw it's very difficult because there's no starch and no satiety uh, please help if I can so so here's the thing I took your question uh, to ultimate weight loss and asked if anybody in the group had this procedure and several came forward and they said they did and they said they would be happy to talk to you personally to see if the group is right for you but know that even if you can't follow the dietary style that we recommend 100% because you can't be eating the large volumes it still would be a nice place for you because of the love and the support of the people that have this common interest these are people that basically have weight to lose and it could be a varying amount but most of them are vulnerable to
to the effects of sugar and flour, whether you want to call yourself an addict or not. So it's a place where people get you because generally your friends that don't suffer this way don't get you and your family certainly doesn't get you. So many people join for that reason alone. We have people that are slender that don't even need to lose weight that join just for the sense of community and camaraderie, which actually is what helps people. You know, I recently interviewed the, uh, a well-known psychiatrist who wrote three books about addiction, Dr. Lance Dotis, and I'm hoping that interview gets released soon. He has a completely different take on addiction that will rock your world. It's unlike anything that any of the other people uh, talk about. He says the 12-step programs not only don't work, but they actually harm. And I'm not saying I agree with him, but I'm saying that when I interviewed him, what he said, what does work about these 12-step programs is the group, is the camaraderie. And that sometimes is enough to take people to the next level. So for that alone, I would suggest you join. But as far as that, I think you could still do the program, whether you could eat the volumes we recommend in one time, that's gonna be the issue. Now, when I interviewed Dr. Garth Davis, and that was a long time ago, I haven't heard this interview for a while, I know that he wants people on this program, not ultimate weight loss necessarily, but whole food plant-based, no oil. He's a bariatric surgeon in Houston who tries to talk his patients out of the operation. So. You know, I don't know if you can have a, a consult with him if you're not gonna go to Houston, but he has a huge social media following on Facebook and Twitter. You might be able to ask him a question there, but I'm pretty sure that he would say yes. It's just that if, you know, whereas I could eat, you know, four pounds of food in a sitting because I haven't had any operation, you might be able to still eat that same food that's on my plate, but you'd have to eat it probably more frequently during the day. But I'm gonna put you in touch with the, the people in the group that have had this. A couple of them said it, I don't know what the word is, if it fell off or it, 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 I guess it got stretched back out and they were gaining some of their weight or all of their weight back, but I'll put you in touch with that because you know the thing is, is if you don't change the behavior, it doesn't matter what procedure you've had. So it looks like you're really making an effort to eat the healthiest diet and change your food. So that's really good. Okay, so Vivi, this is sort of long, so I'm not gonna read it, but I'm gonna give you the gist. So Vivi basically wants to know if I can help her uh, determine what her meal should look like because she she is not losing weight right now and she's thinking that it's the ratio of starch to vegetables. And so, you know, like I said, it's, it's really long, so I'm not going to go into the whole thing. But what I'm gonna do is I think I can help you in that this is where everybody's gonna be slightly different. And everyone needs to find what I call the sweet spot of the ratio to starch to vegetable. And that's what's gonna make you happy, healthy, and you're gonna end up being your leanest self when you find that. A lot of mistakes that people make when they join my program or just do diets in general is they think, oh, we'll just eat salad. You know, and now that's a good thing. You know, Dr. Lyle talked about that in the, I believe it was February 9th, a Dr. McDougall webinar, one of the best webinars he's ever done. You can get it on Dr. McDougall's website. He talked about people think they're gonna be good if they just eat salad or maybe they eat salad and fruit. And it's certainly healthy to eat salad and fruit and I recommend that you do it every day. But again, if that's all you eat, your caloric density is 300 calories per pound or less and most people are gonna get pretty hungry. And when you get hungry, you tend to overeat and it's generally not more salad and fruit. Starch is what is satiating. Starch is what's delicious. It's what satisfies the hunger drive. And anytime you eat under the hunger drive, you can do it. You can weigh and measure your food and you can do anything for a certain amount of time, but you get so hungry that eventually all those hormones of satiety, the leptin and the ghrelin, they get all dysregulated and so they start squirting out, feed me, feed me, feed me, and then you end up overeating and generally it's not, once you get hungry, you don't think like, well, you baked potato, that's when you go get the french fries through the drive-through. So people are afraid of starch. I'm not sure exactly how that happened because I don't know how you can be afraid of a food that's 400 calories a pound, 350 to 400. That's what potatoes and sweet potatoes are and all the wonderful winter squashes, my favorite, which is kabocha and butternut, which we're having for dinner or Hubbard or acorn squash. So, you know, the Okinawans, the longest lived people in Japan who don't suffer with the kind of disease rates we do or obesity, something like, what is it? 72% of their calories from just sweet potatoes. So. I think starch got a bad rap because of the way people were eating it. So people weren't eating like baked potatoes, steamed potatoes, roasted potatoes with herbs and spices or you know ketchup. They were eating uh, potatoes french fried in sugar, fat, and salt. So they took a 400 calorie pound food, turned it into a 2,500 calorie pound food. Or potato chips, where they're taking all the water and the fiber out. Or you know even things like rice, they were not eating the you know the healthier whole grains. They were eating white rice that you know putting butter on it, things like that. Um, 
so so or taking something healthy like a legume a bean that's 550 to 600 calories a pound and making refried beans with lard so they were taking these healthy whole natural foods the foods to the left of the red line but they were turning them into right line foods by the addition of butter and oil and cheese and things like that so we know that starch can't make you fat i've said this many times that carbohydrate and protein are four calories per gram but fat is more than double the caloric density at nine calories a gram. Alcohol is right in the middle at seven. Al alcohol is almost as bad as for you as oil. Well, it's probably worse for you than oil as far as your health is concerned. Just listening to a podcast with a doctor that said how it's really, what did she say? Something like a class one carcinogen. Or I've got to get what she said and, and, and share it with you. But you know, it's not health food alcohol, and it's it's deplorable for weight loss, especially if you're a woman, just based on its caloric density. Liquid calories, you know, are never favorable for weight loss, but. Protein and carbohydrates are less than half the caloric density as fat, you know. Fat you eat is the fat you wear. So when you stop eating fat, especially in the form of oil, which is 4,000 calories a pound, no fiber, no nutrients, atherogenic, atherogenic, obesogenic, and diabetogenic, probably the worst, or cheese, like we talked about at the beginning, you know. This is um, one of the worst things you can eat. High in saturated fat, high in fat. Americans get most of their saturated fat actually from cheese. So when you stop eating those red line, the foods to the right of the red line and not eating the higher fat plant foods like the nuts, seeds, and avocado or eating them in, in small amounts like an ounce a day or one fifth of an avocado, things like that, generally weight loss is facilitated. So I find it goes even faster when you're willing to put aside those high fat plant foods at least for the first 30 days. If you have fat on your body, you're not gonna become fatty acid deficient. So the thing is, is we know that you could eat nothing but potatoes and lose weight. We've cited three studies or at least people that have done this for up to a year at a time and have lost amazing amounts of weight, like Andrew Spudfit Taylor, 120 pounds in one year, eating nothing but potatoes. And I'm not saying that that might be something you wouldn't wanna do, but I don't understand why it would be deleterious to eat you know, a starch and a vegetable. Vegetables are 100 calories a pound but they're only 25% the caloric density of potatoes or sweet potatoes. And again, this is where you've got to play with it because I was rereading the McDougall program for maximum weight loss, the book, and he was saying, make half your plate starch and half your plate non-starchy green and yellow vegetables. Now I didn't say in the book if it should be half it by weight or by volume. My guess is he meant just visually. And so I don't want people to have to weigh and measure. And it's funny because it's Kenny, I feel like I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. For years, I never talked about how much I ate. And then people would see me at these conferences and they would think I have an eating disorder because I'm eating so much food because they don't understand calorie density. And then I started saying, okay, well, this is how much I'm eating. And so Sharon was saying, well, quit saying you eat two pounds of, and how do you know if you're not weighing? Well, well, the reason I know, guys, the reason I know that I eat. She's a chef, she she's well, knows what a pound well, is. What well, a, what but more a, than that, I don't shop at is. farmer's markets. I mean, we have them, but I just generally don't because I buy the really amazing organic produce at Costco and I live next door to Trader Joe's. And so, for example, the bag of zucchini that I love and buy and eat almost every day for breakfast, either steamed or grilled or roasted or spiralized, it, it says 3.75 pounds, which is almost four. And it lasts two days. So do the math. Four divided by two, it's about two pounds a day I know I'm eating. The bag of sweet potatoes that I buy from Trader Joe's, the organic Murasaki, is three pounds. Again, it lasts two days, two lunches, pound and a half. I mean, that's kind of how I know. Or if I get a different, I mean, so so it's not a question of having to weigh on the scale. I just know by how long it lasts. And so the lunch I eat almost every day is a sweet potato with broccoli. So it's a pound of broccoli, and I know that because it's a three pound bag of organic broccoli from Costco that lasts me three days, maybe some days more, some days less. And it's, and I, it's a different bag of sweet potatoes from Costco. So I know that, that before it was cooked, it was two pounds of potatoes and a pound of broccoli. And it's a huge plate. Now, visually, when you look at my plate, it looks like there's more broccoli in terms of volume than potato. Not much, but a little bit. But I'm getting about Sorry, I'm so bad at math. Uh, so I'm getting about 525 calories from the potato, but only about 125 from the broccoli in this huge plate of food. But it's still about half. And you know, if you think about the PCRM power plate, which is this, you wanna show that, Kenny? Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Those are the four categories of food we wanna eat. But another way to look at it is this plate I got at Sweet Tomatoes where it shows fruits and vegetables on the, on I guess the left, and grains and 
Protein. They're called protein, but they're beans, legumes on the right. And so if you just think about making half your plate, be a good Frisbee, huh? Let's see. Yeah, good Frisbee. If you think about making half your plate produce, preferably vegetables, and half your plate starch, that's usually a good way to start. So how do you know if you're eating the right amount for you? Well, I, I've never heard of anybody gaining weight eating left of the red line. There was a study done where if you kept your caloric density to, I believe it was 567 calories per pound per day or less, you could eat ad libitum. That's as much as you want, as often as you want, whenever you want until comfortably full. This is where there seems to be a problem because people that are eating for emotional reasons, they never get full because they're not looking to fill their stomach for, for reasons of hunger. But for people that are in touch with that, which you follow the Ultimate Weight Loss Program long enough, we'll work with you. You'll be able to figure out when you're hungry, when you're full. Eventually, you'll be, I mean, you know that now. It's just that you're eating foods that, that fool your brain's satiety mechanisms like animal products and oils and sugars and flowers and salt and things like that. But the thing is, is you find that sweet spot where you've had enough vegetables to you know to fill you up because of the fiber you know when you, when you have the fiber with the water you create bulk that creates a greater volume then you get that feeling of fullness sooner but the starch is what creates that satiety that feeling like of satisfaction so without the vegetables you probably will need more starch because you need to displace a certain amount in your stomach to feel that stretch, to feel the stretch receptors activated. But if all you ate was vegetables or vegetables and fruit, you'd get that stretch, but you wouldn't get the satiety. So, you know, I wish I could say the answer for you is X plus Y. You have to figure it out on your own. Also, the thing is, is we're different people every day. I mean, some days, on days that I spin for 90 minutes, I'm way hungrier than like today where I'm just gonna be doing three one hour interviews and either sitting or standing. And so I require more food when I expend more more calories. And then days when I'm under the weather, like when I had the flu a couple weeks ago, I, I didn't eat at all for a couple days. So I don't have the exact answer for you. You're gonna have to find that. But visually, it's usually about half and half. And you know you're going in the right direction if the weight starts coming off, even if it comes off slowly, like a half a pound a week. You can always increase the vegetables and decrease the starch, but you don't wanna go too low on that starch so that you feel hungry or dissatisfied. And I wish I had an answer for you, but I'm not a weighing and measuring program. And I don't believe that if I said six ounces, that's necessarily gonna help you anyway, because I don't know how hungry you are on a given day. I don't know when's the last time you ate. But starch isn't gonna make you fat, guys. Human beings cannot convert excess protein or carbohydrates to fat. That's de novo lipogenesis. Pigs do it, we can't. What happens is, since many of us coming to the emotional weight loss, emotional weight loss program, that's a new one. <laughs> the ultimate weight loss program, we could call it the ultimate, uh, the emotional weight loss program, but many of the people are emotional, they're eating emotionally, they suffer from food addictions. And so the, the thing is, is you can't always tell people right away, well, just, you know, don't eat so much. But if you overeat an extra potato, what happens is, is those extra calories don't get converted to fat. They escape through the top of the head as heat or through the fidget factor or gets stored invisibly in the muscles of the liver the as glycogen. fidget factor, I like that. Yeah, so, so, it, it, so starch doesn't make you fat. Fat makes you fat. And when you stop eating fat, you'll realize that that's what made you fat. But you get more dopamine from oil and peanut butter than you do from kale and sweet potatoes, and that's why you go back to it. So we're almost out of time, but I just want to briefly answer somebody's, well, they didn't ask this question. They made a post on our group page, and they said, I'm just not enjoying my vegetables for breakfast. Now, they've only been in the program for a week, and they did not come from being on a plant-based diet. And so here's the thing. When you say you didn't, didn't enjoy your vegetables for breakfast, I like when people are really, really specific because my question, if you're not enjoying vegetables for breakfast, my question is, is what kind of vegetables are you having and how are you preparing them? Because if you don't like one vegetable, try a different one. There are, few, there are a few different ones there. Right. I mean, you know, how many people really say, I hate a cherry tomato. I couldn't eat a cherry tomato, right? So here's the thing. I Google non-starchy vegetable, Mayo Clinic had a list. So are you telling me that nothing on this list appeals to you? Alfalfa sprouts, arugula, artichoke, asparagus, bamboo shoots, green beans, Italian beans, yellow beans, wax beans, bean sprouts, beets, bok choy, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, celery, chayote, chicory, Chinese cabbage, Chinese spinach, cucumber, eggplant, fennel, garlic, green onions, green, beet greens, collard greens, dandelion greens, kale greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, hearts of palm, delicious. 
herbs like parsley, cilantro, basil, rosemary, thyme, jicama, yummy, kohlrabi, don't know what that is, leeks, endive, escarole, romaine, iceberg, mushrooms, okra, onions, parsley, green peppers, red peppers, yellow peppers, orange peppers, jalapeno peppers, purslane, highest source of omega-3 fatty acid, I think even higher than nuts, radishes, rapini, rhubarb, rutabaga, sauerkraut, scallions, shallots, snow peas, pea pods, spinach, summer squash, Swiss chard, tomatillas, turnips, water chestnuts, watercress, zucchini. Not one thing from that list you like. How you prepare it makes a big difference. Check out my video, uh, I think it's called uh, Easy Meals to Keep You Thin. Look at the oven roasted ratatouille. It's so good you could eat all four pounds. Try the balsamic Dijon glazed Brussels sprouts, but realize that vegetables at 100 calories per pound, actually less the, if you're eating the uh, fruity vegetables like the zucchini, okra, eggplant, tom uh, tomato, bell pepper, cucumber, these are actually fruits that we think of as savory, 67 calories a pound, you get no dopamine from that. So of course you're not going to enjoy it because your enjoyment, what you're talking about is based on how much dopamine you're getting. And if you're used to eating animal products, which are way to the right of the red line and oils and things like that, you were getting more dopamine from the breakfast you were having before than you are from these vegetables. Realize we're not telling you not to eat starch. You can eat starch with your vegetables as long as you're going to eat enough vegetables. A lot of people though, when they mix them starting out, what they do is they keep pushing the vegetables away and they end up just eating oatmeal and fruit again. So you start your day with vegetables, but immediately the minute hunger returns, whether it's in one second or one hour, then you eat your starch either by itself or with more vegetables. The thing you have to understand is that you develop taste preferences for foods you habitually eat. And if you grew up eating vegetables, like some cultures do, you would love them. But the fact that they're not giving you enjoyment is because you're not eating them. There's only one taste preference that's inherent in the human being. You know what that is, Kenny? Sugar. Nope. I'm wrong. It came from your mama. Mama's milk. Right, breast milk. Every other taste preference is learned. So I'm sure you've heard of cultures where they think crickets are a delicacy. I oh bet, my God. I bet nobody watching this today, unless you're from one of those countries, would eat a cricket <clears throat> for $1,000, but they love them. And so the thing is, is if you grew up eating vegetables, like the cultures that eat the most vegetables, believe it or not, are the most slender. Can you think of who they are, Kenny? Asians. Absolutely. Asians have only a 3% obesity rate compared to every other culture in the world. It's like they're not even trying, you know, compared to Americans who are the fattest, sickest people on the planet. Well, yes, they eat a starch-based diet, mostly white rice, and maybe they eat a little oil and animal products, but they eat a lot of vegetables. You go to China, and when you get breakfast, you're going to get pickled vegetables. When you go to Korea, in your breakfast, you're going to get kimchi. And in Japan, where I went, what was my breakfast in Japan, Kenny? The hotel. I wasn't there as a vegan, I was there as an entertainer. And every day at the hotel, my breakfast served me miso soup, rice, and salad. And so you develop taste preferences for what you habitually eat. It can take up to 15 times of trying a new food for it to become a preferred food. But the reason you don't enjoy them had not, has really very little to do with taste. It has to do with the amount of dopamine that's being produced. And that is the problem. That's why you're perceiving it as less pleasurable. You know, I told you about this, I believe, in one of the previous episodes about the experiments they did with chocolate. Now, chocolate is 2,500 calories a pound. It's very high in caloric density. It's, it's a little bit less than peanut butter and oil, but it's higher than almost everything else, including sugar and flour. It's, chocolate is actually the most craved food in the world, followed closely by pizza. What's Chocolates. pizza? It's sugar, it's flour, it's cheese. All three addictive foods rolled into one. Sometimes pepperoni on it, so four, another addictive food. And so they did studies with self-professed chocoholics where they, this wasn't about weight, by the way, they brought them into the research lab and they offered them a, a buffet, all you can eat of whatever their favorite chocolate was, candies, cakes, cookies, pies, ice cream, you name it, every brand was there. And they injected them with naloxone. Like, Kenny, do you know what naloxone is? Is there any heroin addicts watching? then you'll know. So naloxone is an opiate blocker that's given in the emergency room if somebody potentially has a fatal heroin overdose if they're brought in in time. The emergency room physician administers naloxone, blocks the blood-brain barrier, and the person hopefully won't die of that fatal overdose because it makes the drug become ineffective. Well, when they injected the self-professed chocoholics with naloxone, they walked up to the buffet, they looked at for what their favorite thing was, they took one piece, they ate one bite and they pushed it away. They had no more desire to eat any more chocolate. So was the chocolate no longer creamy or delicious or luscious 
or will somehow the perception in the brain block. When you understand that almost all the eating you're doing is emotional eating, that no longer are we eating for hunger and survival, then you'll understand the reason you like certain foods better than others. Yes, you may think that chocolate tastes better than kale, but really what it's about is the way it makes you feel in the brain. And since most people are very stressed, people are lonely, they're doing all kinds of things to uh, make themselves more stressed, like watching this instead of exercising. If you're gonna watch Weight Loss Wednesday, do it on a treadmill, do it while you're walking your dog with your headphones. A lot of people are born with what's called low D2 receptivity. They already produce less dopamine in the brain. A lot of people come from families of, of addiction already. And so the thing is when you understand that the reason you're eating these foods is because you're medicating with them. And if you find other ways to medicate like exercise, like maybe having sex or doing volunteer work. There are ways you can feel good in your brain without starting your day with one toxic substance called coffee and ending your day with another toxic addictive substance called wine and medicating all day with toxins and poisons like sugar and flour. The thing is, this is the stuff we teach you in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. I hope you'll consider joining and I hope you'll consider sharing these videos with people that you think might find them valuable. So if there's nothing else, Kenny, we like to keep it under an hour. So Eatonprocess.com. Right. Yeah, that's where, wait one second. Eatonprocess.com is where you submit questions. And I know some of you said you wish this, these can be shorter, but here's the thing. It takes a lot to set up the screen and the lights and to put makeup on. You should see what I look like without it and get Kenny over here. So we've committed to always keeping it under an hour. And if it's too long, just, just watch it five minute bites. So thanks so much guys again for watching another episode of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ and I truly believe that you can have the health and the body you so richly deserve and the Ultimate Weight Loss Program can help you achieve it. Thanks. Bye. Good night all.